So today there's some, I wanted to discuss some other things related to non-holonomic systems. Um, and then towards the end, we'll get to the topic of small oscillations. And that's related to normal modes. So modes of uh, pure oscillatory behavior in the system about equilibrium. And it's, it's formulated pretty well when you look at it in a Lagrangian framework. So this kind of connects with if you've had vibrations it's kind of like vibrations, but um, uh, taken from a Lagrange framework. So let me start with the rolling coin. I had a rolling coin somewhere, a quarter, right? Here's a giant quarter, my giant quarter. And this is an, it's an interesting problem. We're gonna look at it in 3D, okay? So let me let me get the figure in here. This doesn't seem like the right year. Okay, there we go. Rolling coin. Here it is. And this is actually from uh, from Greenwood. Here, 4.2. And the idea is we have a flat disk and it's rolling without slipping. And I mean, what we're going to be studying is, and maybe you've done this with a quarter or something thin, like a wheel, you can get it rolling on the ground. And if it seems to have a certain speed, it stays up. When it slows down, it kind of spirals in and then lands, right? Falls flat. So we want to, we actually want to find out what's that minimum speed necessary to keep it rolling. So we've got a flat disc rolling without slipping, uh, but in 3D. And there's going to be some non holonomic constraints. So this is a, a view of the disk. This actually uses, um, we've got a three, one, three Euler angle convention here. And just because that was what was chosen for that figure, but it, it, it works out well. Um, you've got basically the spin is this phi, I mean, psi, and then you've got this other angle it kind of describes the orientation that the disc is moving with respect to uh, some kind of inertial frame, E1, E2, E3. And then uh, the tilt of the spin axis of the disc is theta. But uh, think of this in just 2D. So we've got, if we had a disc rolling to the, rolling to the right, Here's our disc. It's got some center here. This, this disc has a certain radius, say R, and it's moving. It's rolling that way. If it's rolling that way, then we would have an angular velocity that we'll just schematically show as capital Omega. And the rolling without slipping would say that the velocity if this is purely straight up, uh, so an upright disc without tilting, this would be the velocity is r times omega. Um, you could also think of what does this look like seen from the front? So this is a side view about seen from the front. So if I have this disc, it's rolling at you and it's tilted a little bit. It's got an angular velocity. Um, so we wanna depict that. We'll show first a, 
Here's the vertical and then here's the disc. Tilt it a little bit. And we've got uh, angular velocity. Vector. Omega. And we'll call this small deflection from the vertical alpha. So eventually we wanna, we wanna look at, uh, is the alpha equals zero case, is that stable? Meaning if there's some, some small deflection from alpha, do the dynamics push alpha back towards zero? Even if it wobbles. And I don't know if you've seen a coin, if a coin is going pretty slowly, it starts to wobble and then falls flat. So this is the is alpha equals zero. It's the upright configuration. And we can depict it here too. Alpha. It's the upright configuration. <clears throat> So if the thing is able to, if the disc is able to move with alpha staying zero, that means we have steady rolling, not falling. So if alpha stays near zero, we have steady rolling. So now we just need to get an equation of motion for alpha. And you can you can go through this exercise. It's in um, it's in Greenwood. So essentially, we're asking: Is alpha equals zero stable? So as an equilibrium, is it stable? So after we, if we were to analyze this problem, and I'm not going to go through uh, all of it in great detail. It's just you can work this out. And the details are elsewhere. Uh, the dynamics for small alpha, I'll tell you what it turns out to be. Um, and we're taking into account that this is a disk. So we're using, you know, what's the moment of inertia of a disk about its, about this direction you know, as it's spinning. And there's also gonna be some component moment of inertia about this direction. And we know those are related by a factor of two. But overall, so we get 5 fourths m, the mass of the disk, r squared, that's the radius of the disk, alpha, second derivative with respect to time, equals negative 3m r squared omega alpha plus, I guess you could think of that as the effect of rotation, I think that omega squared here, plus m g r alpha. So some small angle approximations have gone into making this. So, <coughs> pardon me. If we were to, we want to write this in the form of alpha double dot equals something. What is that something? Right now, we'll just summarize it as omega n, negative omega n squared times alpha. Because you notice there's alpha on both sides over here. So we have a second order ODE that's linear in alpha where omega n squared is three, the masses cancel out, we're left with three r squared omega squared minus g r over five fourths r squared. So this looks like a one degree of freedom problem. And we just want to know is alpha equals zero stable or, or not. And it all, all depends on what the sign of omega n squared is. So it should be clear that alpha equals zero, that point itself uh, is an equilibrium point. And what we mean is that in phase space, 
alpha alpha dot equals zero and zero is an equilibrium point. Meaning if you start there, you will stay there, but we wanna know what happens if you're a little bit off. That's what stability is all about. So if, if omega n squared is greater than zero, that means the dynamics is gonna be oscillatory. We have a simple harmonic oscillator. Solutions for alpha are oscillatory. So if we were to plot or sketch what the face portrait looks like, here's alpha dot, here's alpha. We know that the, the middle of this is an equilibrium point, but what happens if we start a little bit off, like up here somewhere? If we start up there, well, this, this is just going to oscillate around. And if we chose some other initial condition, say inside, it's also gonna oscillate around. This is all, this analysis, because we did some small angle approximation, this is only true for small angles alpha. I don't know exactly what the limits are. When you do the small angle approximation, a rule of thumb is like less than 20 degrees. So we've got that. So we say it's stable. If it's oscillatory, that means it's stable. You'll see some wobbling. But uh, what about the other case? So if omega n squared is less than zero, then we'll have you know alpha double dot equals omega n squared. This is going to grow exponentially. So where's the solution for um, alpha double dot equals negative. So I'm doing this so that it's clear that this is a positive thing. And so we have minus positive thing alpha. The solutions for that will be uh, sines and cosines. For this, the solutions will be hyperbolic sines and hyperbolic cosines, which means exponentials. So alpha will grow exponentially if we were to sketch the phase space. Still, we have an equilibrium point at the origin, but what happens if we start a little bit away? If you start a little bit away, well, that just sort of grows exponentially. So alpha will grow. That means if you start with a small angle, that angle will, is just gonna grow. And so this thing falls over. Okay, that's curious. And uh, what does this have to do with some kind of critical speed? Well, the, the critical case is when omega n equals zero, that separates stability from instability. So the critical case is we might write it this way, omega n comma CR for critical equals zero. And remembering, so V is approximately R times omega. We wanna write this in terms of a speed. So if, if you work out, let's go to this equation up here in the upper right, set that equal to zero and you'll get some critical value for capital omega. And we want to rewrite that in terms of a velocity. So if we rewrite that in terms of velocity, then there's a critical speed. The critical speed, square root gr over three. So it relates to gravity, the radius of the disk, and, and that's it. So, a rolling disc, or let's think of a rolling coin, is uh, is stable. It won't fall over, we mean, if the velocity is greater than this critical velocity. So there's some interesting interplay between 
moment of inertia, the non-holonomic constraint, and all that to lead to this result. So you can you can actually find out what is this critical speed for a coin. Um, a U.S. quarter is a good coin. I thought I had one. Oh, there it is. Okay. Quarter. Yeah, that quarter. So if you measure the diameter of the quarter, it's about an inch, slightly less. So the diameter is 2.4 centimeters. So the radius, if we're talking about a quarter, the radius is 1.2 centimeters. So the critical velocity is, let's say, gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. We need to write this in terms of meters, so it's 0 0.012. And then three, what do we get? We get about 0.2 meters per second, which is, I don't know, something like 0.5 miles per hour. Nobody's clocking the speed of a rolling quarter in miles per hour, but anyway. So you can try it. I tried it and it seems to, seems to work out. Um, let me show you. So I've I used the the slow mo mode, and so this is slowed down eight times. But here is that exact quarter rolling. Slow down eight times. So if you if you there's about four the whole width of this that it goes here, it goes about four coin widths in, um, what is it? It's like four seconds, but divided by eight. So it actually works out to about, this is about 0.2 meters per second. This is about as slow as you can get a quarter to go. And of course I've got slow-mo mode, but it's stable below that, right? You, you know what will happen to a quarter, I think, or anything that you roll, it'll just, it'll turn and then it'll fall over, so try it at home. So there's a critical speed and some interesting interplay of non holonoic mechanics that leads to this stability. Um, I guess we could say this was experimentally verified. I didn't show the case where it, it, it fell over. The lighting wasn't good but it does, right? And it, it slows down due to uh, friction and other things that we're just not modeling here. But this is an I interesting result. Things, um, if they reach a certain speed, they're stable. And this also relates to uh, bicycle stability. You can find a uh, critical speed For a bicycle, you know, it will move forward without falling over, without you on it. With you on it, it'll change the speed. Move forward uh, stably without falling over. And there's a professor, uh, Andy Ruina at Cornell, that was really interested in this problem. And uh, he heard some explanations for why is a bicycle stable and he, uh, you know, there's something wrong with them. So there was this paper um, from 1970 in some physics journal. It's like a kind of popularized physics journal. And look at those old 70s photos. He claimed it had something to do with the contact point on the ground being off center of the steering axis and also something related to the gyroscopic force of the wheel, which is I think important for the rolling coin. 
and so this was all just sort of the the understanding about bicycles that it had something to do with gyroscopic forces and this this other thing related to the difference between the contact point but uh you know maybe maybe that's how things go the front wheel definitely has to be able to steer so here is that's Andy Ruina there, I guess, with some you lock up the grad students. tying it, say, the bicycle's no more stable when it's moving than it's still. So yeah, it's so he still, takes the bicycle. It falls over. And makes the front wheel so it can't turn. Up, it falls over just the same way. On falls the other over. Hand, if you untie the steering, it gets back. Yeah, if you let the steering move. Because it can steer to balance itself. On its own, it's stable. And uh, we, you, I think I showed this before where, yeah, it's stable. Once it reaches a certain speed, in fact, it's so stable that you can come up and uh, slam it, and it still stays up. <clears throat> so that's pretty cool. So does it have to do with gyroscopic forces? So and this is rare that anything related to bicycle dynamics makes it into the top journals of the world. This is in science from just a few years ago. There's Andy Ruina right there uh, among the authors. So they made a, a weird bicycle that's self-stable without the gyroscopic or what they call the, the caster effect. That's the, the off-centerness of the, uh, the front wheel and what they called the steering axis and the contact point. So we've got this sort of normal bicycle on the left and then they made this weird thing on the right that had no gyroscopic force uh, involved and there was no caster effect. And this thing on the right was also self-stabilizing. Um, it's, it's so weird. So here it is. They use the inside of a gym. It's technical University Delft. And it is still self-stabilizing. Like, it's the weirdest thing. Um, what you could do is find the it's kind of like the analysis we did for the coin where you find what's the equilibrium of going forward and then and then uh, linearize about that and see if it's stable. So they, yeah, here's the thing they built to actually get rid of the, because the thing does roll, to get rid of the gyroscopic effect, they just had a counter rotating wheel right above it so that you get no gyroscopic effect. You look at eigenvalues as a function of speed here, and there's some critical speed. I think it's this VW, you know, a little above two meters per second where this thing, it'll, it'll go stably. And this is looking at real and imaginary parts of some eigenvalues. To actually write the equations of motion for a bicycle is horrendous and had uh, many, many, I don't think that, yeah, they definitely don't show it here, many, many degrees of freedom. Um, like they said, it took 60 pages to write the full nonlinear equations. And then interestingly, if any of you are familiar with the aerospace department, uh, Mark Psyche is a professor there. Um, and this was his, I think it was his bachelor's thesis. He looked at bicycle stability and he probably wouldn't want me showing this to mom. Yeah, look at that. And it's all this, let's just get into the equation somewhere. Gosh, he's still just defining variables. Look at that, handwritten equations. I think he realized he had an error. So, you know, oh well. But uh, it's an interesting problem, stability of bicycles. And it's not, it's not intuitive. We can't describe it in terms of a gyroscopic effect, which uh, despite, you know, it's kind of on the edge of our understanding how a spinning thing can kind of self-stabilize. But that's not the effect going on. It has to do with just the fact that you have two points of contact with knife edge constraints. So there's no simple explanation for why the bicycle is stable. Sorry. Um, it's just an interesting non-holonomic dynamics effect, which makes you wonder. Hmm. Um, and you might think, you know, I, I don't do anything. I don't do any research with stuff that's rolling. 
I look at uh, aquatic animals or something. I'm trying to make a robotic fish. I don't know if that's you. But there is an interesting analogy between non-holonomic rolling systems and aquatic locomotion. And I'll, I'll share that with you. Uh, I guess, yeah, I'll say aquatic locomotion. And I, all my knowledge about this is due to a friend, Scott Kelly, who's at University of North Carolina, Charlotte. And let me show you something. This will work. So up at the top, this is a, it's kind of like the, um, uh, the roller racer where there's there's a wheel in the back that's a point of contact. I get, think of it this way. It's a shopping cart with a toddler in it and the toddler's twisting back and forth. So this rotor on top is like a child twisting back and forth in a shopping cart. And as the child twists, the thing will actually start moving, right? It'll It'll go forward. And that's a bit like a biological swimmer. The biological swimmer, it twists its body. And of course it's shedding vortices, but that point of contact in the back can be considered like a non-holonomic constraint. It's like you're, the wheel thing is kind of pushing off the floor the way you ride roller skates and um, the fish is pushing off the water. Here's another view of that where we don't actually have the fish bend. It's just a rotor on the fish twisting back and forth. So it's just a, a foil and you get the same kind of effect. So uh, these are all simulations by Scott and he, I think built one of these. So this is a, it's just a foil in the water and a mass moving back and forth on top. And you see that that's, that's enough to get this thing to locomote and turn and do some cool stuff. So he's been doing some interesting things related to these swimmers. There's some other, and we're not sure why there might be any parallel here, but small microorganisms like a paramecium, they seem to move along, they're kind of these oval shaped things that wanna move in the direction of their oval shape, but they create these tracks that look a lot like the tracks you would see from a non-holonomic system. So even though this is this model on the left is just like a, a kid's toy with a spinning rotor, but its trajectories make um, this interesting pattern where these there's these long segments and then it's kind of moving around. Um, so it at least looks like micro swimmers and maybe not just micro swimmers, it looks a little bit like how sharks forage so who knows, there may be something, there may be something hardwired into biological systems where they are. They're using some kind of non-holonomic dynamics without quite knowing it. Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, there's some other mysterious non-holonomic things. I don't know if any of you have seen the rattlebacks. I've got it in front of the camera. This is, it looks like a canoe shape, but it's the mass distribution is just slightly not symmetric. These are called rattlebacks. And they're kind of like uh, one way spinning tops. They have a preferred direction they want to go. And if well, let me just show you. Uh, yeah, so here, this is another of my films. So if you spin it one way, it stops and wants to go the opposite way. So this thing likes turning counterclockwise. So if I start it counterclockwise, it's fine, it's happy. But now if I get it going the other way, now I've slowed it down so you can see what happens. 
it's like it goes from turning clockwise to this rocking mode, and from the rocking mode, it starts turning counterclockwise. And then we'll speed it back up again, you could see. So uh, that's weird. And you don't you don't need some fancy thing like this. You could use a piece of gum. Uh, this is a you just Google how to you take your one of these strips of gum and you just fold it in some kind of weird non-symmetrical way and it, it'll show the same behavior. In fact, you could have something that's this is a simulation, but perfectly symmetrical kind of uh, half of an ellipsoid and then you have these off center masses. And that's enough to get it going into this rocking mode and wanting to go the way that it prefers. It's not scale dependent either. So you can make gigantic ones. Somebody, it's like somebody used a 3D printer and just went um, crazy. Uh, not sure of the practical use, but a curious behavior. Like you can learn a lot from these toys. This thing I think started out as a toy. Uh, I wonder if this one works. Yeah, you could bend a spoon. And I'm, I mean, I'm not advocating the destruction of spoons, but yeah, the spoon shape, he gets it going here. Okay, let's hear the explanation. And I think it does multiple turns. So that's weird. And in fact, it's like an open research question. How do rattlebacks work? Because you'd have to model the six degrees of freedom for, for the rattleback. I don't know if it has some other name. I think it does. Something having to do with stones. I think this started out, they, they, there were some stones that people found, smooth stones uh, at the bottom of a riverbed. And they noticed they had this unusual property when you would spin them. So, all right. All right, so we're gonna talk now about small oscillations and normal modes about uh, equilibria. And this will be in, in N degrees of freedom. So several problems that we've uh, talked about, you, you're able to find what the oscillations are in one degree of freedom. You just kind of linearize, like if your variable is X, then you'll turn this into X double dot equals some function. And usually we've been writing it as negative omega N squared X. You usually linearize and find out, okay, this omega N, what is that? We're calling it omega N because it's the frequency of the normal mode in that direction. So in one degree of freedom, this isn't uh, too terribly difficult. Um, and in fact, you can deduce a lot from just looking at a potential energy surface. So we won't use X, let's use uh, Q. So we're, we're gonna do, be doing this in the generalized coordinate framework of Lagrangian dynamics. So suppose we have Q and a potential energy for Q. And if it looks, I don't know, something like that. You could identify where the equilibria, it's the, these critical points. And of course the hilltops will be unstable. If you're a little bit away from it, you'll move away. And the valleys, valley floors will be stable. So you could identify things that are stable and unstable. And then the frequency of the oscillation is actually gonna be related to the curvature around each U-shaped valley. But what if you have more than one degree of freedom? So, if we have n equals two degrees of freedom. 
Um, here is a, well, I mean, let me show you a video. I like videos. This is a, a surface that a colleague of mine, Lori Virgin at uh, Duke, um, it's, it was a solid piece of Lexan that's about this big on each side. And he created this uh, uh, using a CNC milling machine, created this potential energy surface. And if you put a marble on this, it'll, it'll move around just like uh, any, any two degree of freedom situation. So this was released and you can see there's, there's several different types of equilibria here, but eventually this will settle down in one of the four. There's like four bowls connected by uh, saddle points and then a hilltop in the middle. And this will eventually because of friction, you know, settle down in one of the bowl shapes. Um, and since we did say bowl, I like this video. I don't know how many times they had to do this. Just throwing a bowling ball in like a swimming pool thing and strike. Nice. So you could think of a you know an actual ball moving in a two-dimensional potential energy surface. That's that's good, but there there's other situations like ship dynamics. If you think of a ship, a boat, and you know, the two degrees of freedom are say roll and pitch. Um, you could look at the potential energy surface that's given by buoyancy and other effects. And here it is. So this is a potential energy surface where I think it says X and Y, but really one of them has to do with pitch. The other has to do with roll. I think it's this degree of freedom here. This is actually the uh, roll degree of freedom. And then we have pitch. And then just to uh, show you, you know, where the, here's a, there's an equilibrium right in the, the middle where the ship is upright. And that's where you wanna be if you're on a ship. And then there's these saddle points, which are sort of critical points. If you cross them, then you have capsized and you'll sort of be on your side and that's not good. So um, near this stable equilibrium point, there's going to be, there's going to be, um, you could find two frequencies. There'll be a frequency related to the natural roll motion. So a ship, right, roll back and forth. And then there'll be another direction that's related to pure pitch. Oops, so you'd have omega due to pitch. So there's two natural frequencies and they're related to what's the shape of the, the paraboloid that closely approximates the U shape of the potential energy surface at that equilibrium point. Um, and it's known in ship dynamics that if the ratio of these two frequencies is a rational number, then you can have problems. So if you have omega roll, omega pitch is equal to, you know, a rational number, like, you know, one half, two thirds, or even if it's close, this leads to trouble. It's called uh, parametric resonance. And this phenomena is one where it sort of makes sense if, if you're on a ship and you have a wave coming from the side that could kind of get the roll motion excited and then you would perhaps capsize. Um, but the same thing can happen with pitch. So you could have you could steer your boat into waves 
and they get the pitch excited a lot. And due to this parametric resonance, there's some, the motion in pitch could actually become motion in roll and then uh, you'll still capsize. So that's why it leads to trouble. So ship designers try to avoid this criterion, try to stay away from the ratio of those two frequencies being a rational number. Um, but we're, I'm trying to motivate right now just the idea of potential energy surfaces and that there are frequencies and we, we will be able to calculate what these frequencies are and the uh, modes of, of motion. For a ship, it's kind of uh, intuitive. There would be pure motion and roll and pure motion in pitch. For other systems, it's maybe not so uh, obvious. So what if we had three or more degrees of freedom, then we can't even draw a 2D potential energy surface. So we might say, oh, what do we do now? I don't know. Let me give you a situation. Here is uh, three pendula. So suppose I had three pendula and then I connect them by springs. So this is three degrees of freedom, these three angles. The motion, um, the pure motions are not obvious. Um, it, it turns out there are as many pure motions. And by that, I mean, it's periodic in that motion as degrees of freedom. So in this case, there are three pure motions of the pendula. And you could kind of maybe see what they are. One is they all move rigidly, like they all rotate together as one. Another motion is the middle one sort of stays still and the other two just sort of bounce, the outside two bounce back and forth anti-symmetrically. And then there's a third mode, which is definitely not obvious. Two of them get closer together and one goes further away, but you could solve for all of those. Um, so that's one case. Here's another. Suppose I have a wooden beam attached by springs to um, a ceiling. So this wood, this beam, I could pull down on it and let go and I think you could see that, I mean, if these springs are symmetric, if they've got the same spring constant, then this thing will move up and down. So that's at least one of the modes. Um, well, I guess first, how many degrees of freedom is this? We're sort of tracking basically the center of mass and also the angle that this thing makes. So there's three degrees of freedom because we're looking at the rigid body in 2D. So it's got two translation and one angle. Um, but the pure motions about the equilibrium, equilibrium is you let go of this, what does it do? It's just gonna kind of settle down. There's up and down pure motion, but what are the other two? I, it's not obvious. You might think, well, they're side to side, but then what's the other one? I don't know. I'll give you a hint though, side to side, pure side to side motion is not one of the modes. So here is how we do it. Um, even if we can't visualize the potential energy surface. We can still uh, find the pure modes and they're not called pure, they're called, they're called normal modes. Motion in a circle, no, it's no motion in a circle. I would actually love it if someone could build this. And then I can, it kind of looks like a uh, modified version of a swing or something like a deck chair that's connected to the top of the patio. All right, so we'll first look at one degree of freedom work this out and then generalize to N degrees of freedom. So in one degree of freedom, 
what do we have? We'll call it Q1. And I'm going to draw schematically the uh, a potential energy surface that has a, a minimum. They don't always have to have a minimum. So this is the potential energy drawn as a function of Q1. This minimum point, we'll call that Q0. So Q0 is the minimum of the potential energy. It's an equilibrium point. And you know how how would we find it? You take the partial derivative of u as a function of q1 and set it equal to zero. And so this thing satisfies that. All right. Now if we if we start uh, at that position, q1 equals q naught with an initial velocity equal to well, zero, then we're at equilibrium. But what are the small oscillations? What's the frequency of the small oscillations? So using our, hopefully you, Remember when we said from the potential energy, if we just have one degree of freedom, you could sketch what the uh, face portrait looks like, just qualitative things. Like in this case, around Q1, sorry, around uh, Q0, you'll have closed curves. And maybe things break down once you get to sort of large enough amplitudes, but we're just talking about very small, you know, what are the small oscillations? So to analyze the stability, we will do, let me kind of put this in there, keep it on the screen. To analyze stability, we do a Taylor series expansion. Of the potential energy. near that equilibrium point. And we'll, we'll write Q1 is Q0 plus some small deviation, delta Q1. So this is a small displacement from equilibrium. Let's sketch things up here. Um, so we might need this later. What is the value of the potential energy at that minimum? And then we're saying if we deviate a little bit by some delta Q1, which could be positive or negative. So now we are you know, here on the potential energy curve. What will the dynamics be? So if you were to write the, um, this Taylor series expansion, right? You've got U of Q1. And the way the Taylor series expansion works is you just, you look at the, uh, we're talking about a scalar function U evaluated at the point of interest, U naught plus, and now we just start taking derivatives in a certain way partial u, partial q1, evaluated at q0 times delta q1, plus one over two factorial, second derivative of u with respect to q1, evaluated at q0 times delta q1 squared, and uh, so on. We'll just use this uh, uh, reminder, things of order q1 to the third, because we're assuming a small displacement so that all these higher order terms uh, are 
less and less significant. Okay, what, what can we say about this Taylor series expansion? Well, this is a constant. It's not a function of the small displacement. So it's not gonna be important for the dynamics. We don't care about what that constant value is. So we're going to ignore it. It's just sort of setting an energy point. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, by the definition of an equilibrium point, this is zero. So we're at an equilibrium point, either a minimum, a maximum, or an inflection point. Um, so this partial U partial Q1 is zero. So now we're left with this term, which is not zero in general. It's giving the concavity of the uh, potential energy surface. So whether that's positive or negative, basically tell us if this is stable. We, right, if we're at a minimum, then this will be positive, will be concave um, up. But from its quantitative value, we can get some things as well. that I say this gives the concavity of the potential energy curve. And then these terms were just they're small enough we ignore them. Okay, so uh, collecting all of this, we have that u q1 equals the only thing that we care about is this one half. Two factorial is just two. And then partial squared u partial q1. So the second derivative of u with respect to q1 evaluated at that point times delta q1 squared. Right, so this is the potential energy at some nearby. It's all that we care about. It's What's the, how does the potential energy vary as a function of Q1, uh, delta Q1? This thing is constant because we can just ev evaluate it. So all we have is uh, something that's quadratic in the small displacement. So what is, the, what is a Taylor series doing? If we were to kind of zoom in on what's happening near that equilibrium point, Say we've got a curve that looks like that. That's the true curve. The Taylor series expansion gives a local approximation. So it's a, this is what one half second derivative of u with respect to q1 squared evaluated at q naught. And then this is the true. So it, it's a good approximation for small, uh, small displacements, delta Q1. All right. And this concavity thing, right? If this second derivative is greater than zero, then, and that's what I've been sketching. That means we've got something that's concave up. So we have a stable point. If the second derivative is negative, then it's concave down. So it would be unstable. And if it equals zero, you have an inflection point which would be, I just say it's unstable. Okay. Um, I'm gonna just jump to the general n degree of freedom case because that gives a concrete way as to how to calculate what the frequency, the frequency of motion back and forth along through here is going to be related to the second derivative term. But uh, we may as well just do the n degree of freedom. 
So in N degrees of freedom, capital N, we'll say that the equilibrium position, we'll still write it as Q naught, but now it's a, it's a vector. So Q naught one all the way to Q naught in the nth position. And we'll also talk about the small displacement from equilibrium and we'll call that delta Q. And that will be another vector. It'll be a scalar delta Q in each of the directions. And then following procedure from above. So we're, we're assuming we already know what the equilibrium is. You can solve for the equilibrium by looking at where the first derivative vanishes. But we'll expand the potential energy, which is a function of Q1 through Qn. Um, and remember, so let's just say it will call, we'll sum up the Q1 through Qn is just Q. Q is Q naught plus delta Q. So we're looking at a vector displacement from a point Q naught. This will equal the potential energy at Q naught, which is a constant. And then from the n dimensional generalization of the Taylor series expansion, this becomes a sum partial u partial qi evaluated at q naught delta qi. But of course, because this is a um, equilibrium, this is going to be zero. It's going to be constant. And all of the action is in this second order term. So this would be this is a double sum over i and j. It's all of the second derivatives. I think this is called the these are elements of the Hessian matrix. We evaluate these second derivatives at the equilibrium point, and then this is time delta q i delta q j. And then just to remind ourselves, I'll just say three. So it's order three in the small um, displacements. Okay, we will call this term, um, we'll call this u i j. So we're gonna be constructing a matrix u um, but let's just write the potential energy near the equilibrium point. We'll be able to write as it's one half this double sum ij uij delta qi delta qj, where uij is just the second derivative of u with respect to the i and j generalized coordinates evaluated at the equilibrium point. So, right, we've dropped this constant term, this thing zero, so that's what we're left with to second order. So to lowest order. Um, for each coordinate, we've got the displacement And if you were to take the time derivative, so d by dt of that, you've got qi dot equals, well, the equilibrium position, that thing is just zero, plus delta qi dot. So qi, I mean, q dot, the vector q dot is the same, well, qi dot is delta qi. And that's gonna be important because we could also expand the kinetic energy and I'll just give you what the answer is. If you expand the kinetic energy, right? This was just potential energy, but you gotta deal with kinetic energy too. The kinetic energy is one half a double sum for i and j, t i j, Delta Q I dot Delta Q J 
dot. And you basically get the entries of Tij just by looking at the kinetic energy. So we have a quadratic U and T, it, meaning it's quadratic in these small displacements from equilibrium. Okay. So we have a, a potential energy and kinetic energy that are quadratic in the displacements and the velocities respectively. And we've since we've already defined these like uij and tij, uh, we may as well write these as matrices. It leads to some compact notation if we introduce a potential energy matrix and a kinetic energy matrix. So we'll introduce these n by n matrices u. And just to emphasize that it's a matrix, I'll put a double underscore with uh, entries u, i, j and T matrix with entries T, I, J. And both of these matrices are symmetric. And I'll put that as a little note. All right, so if you take T transpose, you get T u transpose, you get u. We can write the Lagrangian in terms of right, this u and t in the usual way. So we can write the Lagrangian, if you want, it's expanded about the equilibrium point. And we'll use as a, the generalized coordinates, the delta Qs, and just to emphasize that they are now gonna be treated like a column vector. So delta Q, it's delta Q1, all the way down to delta Q n. So we'll use those as generalized coordinates. We write the Lagrangian T minus U. And this will be one half. I right? just substituted in what we've got up above. There was an overall one half, the double sum T I J delta q i dot delta q j dot minus u i j delta q i delta q j. And then this looks really nice if we write it in um, vector form. Uh, I mean, sorry, matrix form. We have one half delta q dot transpose t delta Q dot minus delta Q transpose U, the matrix delta Q. So that is our Lagrangian near the equilibrium point. And if you were to write Lagrange's equations, you could summarize them in matrix form. And what do we get? We get T delta Q double dot plus U delta Q equals zero. So these are N linear second order ODEs, capital N 
linear second order ODEs. And being in matrix form makes things kind of convenient. Um, I will give an aside here. We're not going to pursue this approach, but I guess you could. If you said that, so if you want to put this into kind of a form that maybe you've seen before, if you say X is Delta Q, and we want to put this in the form X double dot equals a X, then in, in this case, you can do some matrix multiplication. You'll see that a equals negative T inverse times Q. So you could you could do that. We're not going to do that. Um, instead, uh, we're going to we're going to assume that we have oscillatory solutions. So let's try an assumed oscillatory. Solution, uh, and and I'll call this equation star up here, in star. So we'll say delta Q J as a function of time is some constant C times A J cosine omega T plus B where here J goes from one to N. And what we've got here is a, we've got uh, this V is a phase. Omega here is some frequency of motion. Um, C is an overall scale factor. And AJ would be the relative amplitude in the QJ direction. If we assume this and then plug it into our equations of motion, that start equation, then uh, we get a relationship between what the frequencies and the amplitudes have to be. So, right, we're trying this assumed solution in star. If you do plug it in, then you get that the relative amplitudes, AJ, are related to uh, the frequency by an equation that looks like this, right? We use the same frequency in each direction, but a different relative amplitude. Um, we'll call this matrix of A's, right? It's just the relative amplitudes in each of the directions. This is looking like a eigen vector equation. And the frequency satisfies something that's like an eigenvalue equation. They take the determinant of this, set it equal to zero. So we've got, um, you would first, You'll, if you do this, you'll find frequencies. And for each frequency, then you could solve for the relative amplitudes using this upper equation. The relative amplitudes tell you the normal mode. The frequencies you find are called the natural frequencies or normal mode frequencies. This is, is called the characteristic equation for the natural frequencies of the normal modes 
uh, the amplitudes that you would you'll find, and you'll find a different sequence of amplitudes for each frequency. So this is uh, this this will give you a polynomial just like a eigenvalue equation, and it's kind of um, uh, to simplify things. Instead of writing omega squared, we'll um, say let's write lambda k equals omega k squared. So these are the roots. This polynomial is going to look like lambda one minus lambda, lambda minus lambda one, lambda minus lambda two, right? It has, it has n roots. And I've written the case where all roots are distinct. Uh, you'd have to do, make some special considerations just like with any eigenvalue problem if there's uh, double roots and so on. So this is if all roots are distinct. And then kind of like what we did above for the rolling coin, right? If uh, lambda k is omega k squared, if this is greater than zero, then you have oscillation. or kth mode. And we would say it's, it's a stable mode. If lambda k is uh, less than zero, then we have exponential growth. And so it's unstable. mode. And now we do consider the case of if this is equal to zero, we get steady drift. Um, we might call it neutrally stable or it's sometimes called a rigid body mode. And so once you've found these roots for each you know, lambda k, uh, for each of these n modes, you solve for the mode shapes using that first equation. So u minus lambda k t, and we'll write this as a, a. So solve for solving for a k is like finding an eigenvector. And it's going to be right, an n dimensional vector of modes. Uh, what the mode looks like. So we've sort of set this up. We'll look at applying this after the break. So this is the last class um, for the break. Um, there'll be one more homework that's kind of related to this small oscillation stuff and maybe one other thing. Um, that's, that's it. So we'll talk about normal modes and normal coordinates next time.